I'm Susanna Wright from Oxford Brookes University UK and for this presentation I'm looking at memories of British peace movement activism from the 1920s to 1960s and I'm um, delighted to be here as part of this conference. So I'll start with some background about the research and some methodological thoughts on the sources I focus on today. Here are some images to get you into the topic. Many thousands of children and young people in Britain between the 1920s and the 1960s were involved in the peace movement. They appeared on posters, rendering problematic or even unnatural the connection between fighting and weapons and childhood. They dressed up in national costumes for pageants. They were taken by their parents on the march, or of older, they could assemble themselves and carry placards or banners or kind of stand there holding, holding them as they are in this photo. For some, these encounters with the peace movement were brief. A few school assemblies or lessons, attending a meeting or a film screening, a single demonstration. For others, there were longer periods of, of intensive engagement, sometimes over a number of years. And for a smaller subsection still, this translated into a commitment long into adulthood. However, children in the British peace movement Oh, sorry, sensitive um, button here. Children in the British peace movement don't feature much in histories of childhood, notwithstanding a focus on youth movement, activism and politicisation in recent research. They also don't feature in histories of the peace movement itself, which are mostly focused on major campaigns, adult leaders and heroic figures. So now I can move on. This paper fits with a larger monograph topic I'm, project I'm involved in on this topic, where I'm aiming for a bottom-up perspective through a wide range of sources. I'm looking at what Martin Seidel has termed the primary peace movement, organisations whose main aim was to campaign for some version of peace, whether through internationalism, such as the League of Nations Union, outright pacifism and um, groups like the Peace Pledge Union, or anti-nuclear action um, like the campaign for nuclear disarmament, CND. Um, one set of sources I've looked at, archived oral histories, speak literally to the theme of this conference. So that's where my focus is today. I'm drawing on oral histories of 27 peace movement activists. I didn't quite get to the 30, I promised in the abstract. Um, 13 male and 14 female, born between 1895 and 1930. These interviews um, are located in two repositories, the Imperial War Museum Sound Archive, much of which is online, and the recordings of the Women's, Women Conscientious Objector Research Project found in the British Library. Um, most of the interviews for the former were conducted in the 1980s, and it's the late 1990s for the latter project. Um, for obvious reasons, during COVID times, I've been able to access more of the Imperial War Museum sound archive than the other collection. As to the questions I'm asking, I'm interested first in what interviewees have to say about why they were drawn to the peace movement as children. But secondly, given this time frame of my study over several decades, I also focus on their views on being an adult in the peace movement and promoting their cause among children and young people. So archived oral histories are a complex um, source to use. So here are a few methodological thoughts. Um, firstly, there's an extensive methodological literature around oral history, which is relevant here. Discussions are focused on, among other things, the creation of narratives informed by later, later events and co-constructed between the interviewer and the interviewee. There's also been the challenge of disaggregating what the individual remembers about themselves from wider social memories which other people have discussed and which they've seen around them. There's also the matter of selection of interviewees who the researcher has chosen to interview and interviewees own identification as someone who is appropriate for that particular purpose or project. So in my case, is the people who self-identify 
as peace movement activists or women conscientious objectors. So all of these are pertinent issues. And as Musgrave et al. note in the introduction of their wonderful edited collection from 2019, they mean that even if we get individual perspectives, we're definitely not in the realms of accessing in a direct way an authentic truth or, ex or authentic experiences. So there's all this, and then beyond that, archived oral histories, as opposed to interviews that you conduct yourself as a researcher, bring in additional benefits and additional challenges. They may not fit directly with my research questions names, and um, I found this particularly in relation to the second question I posed. We'll come on to that a bit later. Um, next, um, as Joanna Bournat and April Galway and others have noted, there are important ethical and epistemological questions. So by listening to these interviews between 2019 and 2021, I'm complicating the analysis by adding an even longer passage of time. And I'm confirmed, informed by the concerns and the values of the present, as well as my own particular engagement with the issues at hand. And ethically, even if interviewees and interviewers for that matter, read their information sheets, and fully consented to the retention of their interviews for general use and for posterity, could they have fully comprehended the implications of being public and potentially very public for the Imperial War Museum ones that are online for perpetuity? So all this makes it important, I think, for me to listen sympathetically and to take care in the way that I present excerpts. And finally, how can we best analyse archived oral histories as historians? Um, if I understood him correctly, at a panel discussion I zoomed into in March, Alessandro Portelli suggested that archived oral histories should be analysed as other mainly written texts are in the archive. Even if you're listening into recordings as opposed to just reading transcripts, because without the direct interaction between interviewee and interviewer, he argues, they become, they, they become similar to other sources. Um, yet for me, the act of listening in can elicit a powerful response. So now I focus in more on archived oral histories in my particular context, that is children in the peace movement. So a set of issues cluster around the intersection of the passage of time, age and power. And I'm just going to pick a few highlights here. So firstly, we are dealing with what Sarah Kenny has described as remembered experience. We're not talking about direct experience. And does the experience of being a child and assumptions about being less able and powerful at that time that accompany it influence what is remembered and what is recalled in the interview context? So can the adult eye speak for the child eye? So I'm examining this point briefly through three examples from the interviews. Firstly, there's Jane Dennett, later a CND activist, who claims at several points in her interview to have been a rebel and a reformer from a young age. And you see this sort of pattern of someone establishing a thread in other interviews too. Douglas Burgess, a Christian pacifist and the firstborn of the interview these I've listened to, instead talks about softening and increasingly nuanced understanding with age, so recognising a break between the person who's speaking now and the child of the past. And others again reflect the sort of pattern he identifies. John Duncan Marshall is more unusual in his awareness of the difficulty of understanding what's happening at the time and reflecting on it. So, on the issue of individual and collective voices, it's important to think about the way in which the interviews highlight the individual stories and are about their subjectivities. This is sort of the thing that Celia Hughes talks about in her study of them. Um, 
left political activists. But at the same time, they, they're impacted by the context of a wider movement. Either as peace movement activists or women conscientious objectors. These are collective categories. Oh, sorry, too quickly. And then my final point here is about the impact of listening. So while not wanting to take on the, the great um, Alessandro Portelli, whose work I love, um, I'm not convinced that listening to a voice doesn't actually make a difference. It makes these a particularly powerful um, emotive source, I felt. Um, like April Galway, I found myself liking some interviewees more than others. I felt a kind of more, more of a connection to their emotion, maybe you do just with the written word. I gained a feeling of familiarity with the interviewer as well, and you almost end up sort of siding with them, hoping for a good interview. All this matters, of course, but I'm not sure yet how or why. So I'm moving on to some exemplar findings. Um, most interviewees, in keeping with the life history format, um, offered an extended discussion of their childhood. So the few examples that I've included here are a small subse subsection of many I could have included. Um, I'm covering two main categories of childhood influences here. And there's not the time for other important ones, such as religion, politics, and the kind of cultural impact of war through things like books and films. So, on to family. Many interviewees noted their family as a force that moved them towards the peace movement. Margaret Sharp exemplifies those whose families were directly affected by deaths in combat during the First World War. This not only led to the letter mentioned here in this quote, but an unhappy period of her mother's breakdown and eventual death, and then having to live with other relatives and not feeling welcome in their family or in their domestic unit. Margaret describes these experiences leading both to an evangelic religious conversion and a conviction that she must work for peace herself. John Duncan Marshall instead talks about the impact of parents and their friends coming back from fighting in the war, but working for an internationalist and pro-peace, if not fully pacifist world for the future. He's also of course touched on the um, influence of the cinema and the anti-war films that were coming out by about 1930. I've picked two further examples here under the theme of family in order to illustrate different responses to parental preferences and beliefs. Kathleen Wiggum was born into a spiritualist family in Rochdale. Their religious beliefs emphasised the sanctity of life so support for pacifism and conscientious objection in the First World War on her parents' part followed from this. It isn't quite clear whether Kathleen witnessed her parents doing this directly or just their later recounting of their stories, hence my question mark next to her date of birth. Kathleen very much followed her parents' lead on this and recounts their work in an almost sort of heroic way. Peter Pirrie, on the other hand, sorry, <laughs> witnessed so I found his own way into left-wing politics and the peace movement. He presents this as escaping his confined family and a rejection of his mother's almost fanatical focus on death. He also talks about alcoholism and fascist politics in the household too. His position is perhaps a bit more unusual. It was less usual to reject parents outright in this way than it was maybe to follow them in the way that Kathleen Wiggum did. And there are lots of people who fall somewhere in between these two. So school also comes out as a prominent influence. An anonymous interviewee in the British Library's Conscientious Objectors Collection is one of several, mainly female interviewees, who mentioned the League of Nations Union in their school. Here this is presented as a zeitgeist, something everyone did. And LNU junior branches were indeed very common in girls' gram grammar schools in the period being discussed. She also not notes reference to the League of Nations and its aims being taught in history lessons. Um, but someone like me looking back on this knows that whatever she says about it, 
it wasn't in fact taught in every school. Um, for others like Marjorie Jones, it was particular teachers who were significant. Um, this comes through for some boys as well as girls. And um, Marjorie Jones talks here about her history teacher who was a Quaker and who might have presented a certain spin on history, which um, was influential. So these examples have referenced school as a pull towards the peace movement. For others, it could also push people that way. So Francis Breakspeare talks about the officer training for in his school and his reaction to it. Um, active links to the military in this form were very common in fee paying boys schools um, in the interwar years period. Um, Francis Breakspeare relates his antipathy towards the OTC to his kind of long standing preferences and personality traits. And this implies that others didn't necessarily respond to it in the same way that he did. So, for the second of my questions, looking at interviewees' um, views on being adults in the peace movement and promoting their cause among children and young people, there's a lot less to go on. The material I present isn't just the tip of the iceberg as it was. Um, just a minute ago. I don't know exactly why this is. Um, it's not directly addressed in interview questions, so that's probably part of it. But maybe interviewees also don't define what they do with children as part of their peace movement activism as much as their individual adult choices. Some interviewees talked about what happened in their own family and with their own children. So Eric Sly had some interesting observations to make. Firstly, when referencing his activity in the 1930s with the Peace Pledge Union and during the Second World War, as a reporter who um, recorded what went on in conscientious objection tribunals, he noted that all this activity took him away from his own family, but he felt he had to do it for the future of his children and other children too. He also discussed dynamics within his own family when it came to his own son's call-up notice um, at the time of the Second World War. He suggested that his children were aware of his and his wife's um, pacifist views, but that they weren't an undue influence. His son, he notes, struggled with the decision that he didn't necessarily want to do something different with his friends, from his friends. So jump forward to the late 1970s, sorry, late 1960s, and Jane Dennett talks about participating in direct action with CND against ships in the Bristol Channel, which were carrying nuclear waste. She took her son on a demonstration on this activity with her when he was 14. And she talks about her arrest and the actions that others took to try to prevent the arrests that were going on having a politicising and emotional effect on her son. That's her version of it anyway. For other interviewees, the impact on children was through school teaching or youth work. So Mildred Pirrie, the wife of Peter Pirrie, who has been mentioned earlier, recalls the dilemmas she faced as a pacifist teacher in the late 1930s, when it came to gas mask fitting in her school. She initially resisted, but ended up joining in when the children in her class weren't happy being fitted by a relative stranger in the form of the head teacher who wasn't often in the classroom. Um, next up, Douglas Burgess recalls the pacifist group that he set up in Sussex, talking about my young men. These would have been sort of 18 to 20 year olds and supporting them when they registered their conscientious objection in the Second World War and were called to the tribunal. And finally, William Spray became headmaster of Leighton Park School, a Quaker school in Reading. And he recalls telling people, sorry, pupils there, about his time in the, no, about the Friends Ambulance Unit in the Second World War. And he actually left it to pupils to read a book to discover that he had been involved in it himself. They obviously didn't think that his, um, that their headmaster could have had all those um, adventures. So, some concluding thoughts.
Firstly, my thoughts on archive door histories. They definitely come with methodological and ethical challenges, but I found them valuable for hearing and literally for hearing the voices of children in the past, even if these children are adults by the time you hear from them. Secondly, the perspectives presented in these um, oral histories highlight a range of agentic expressions. Following people like Susan Miller and um, Mona Gleason, I'm careful to shine away from the narrow definition of, of agency as rebellion and rational choice. There is some resistance in rebellion, definitely, but maybe more often than that, there's a sentence conformity to. Um, thirdly, I'm looking at individual accounts in a movement context. So I'm alert both to commonalities and varied and nuanced engagements with matters of war and peace. Fourth and fifth, why is all this important? Political subjecthood and activism in the peace movement was clearly a significant component in the lives of many British children from the 1920s to the 60s. So this means it's worth studying in its own right. You could pick a group of children in certain years and stop there, and that would be fine. But I'm looking across a number of years, and whilst I shy away from serving a higher master of grown-up history, I do see broader implications. Looking over decades as I do, the role of generations becomes important. And potentially, I think that relationships between generations in families, in schools, in local communities can help to explain what happens in the peace movement over time. So a study of mine is important as alongside the existing focus on the big campaigns and the heroes. And here are some references which you can pause to look at if you want to follow anything up, or you can email me or contact me on Twitter using the contact details at the start. Um, this is an ongoing project, so I welcome your insights and your input. Thank you for your attention.